become pretty impressed with some of the uh, investment that exists there. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I really grew up in the organic movement, and I, I find myself increasingly feeling like, um, especially young people who don't really understand how much work went in, into developing organic standards, hashing all that out, developing political structures to, uh, you know, really lobby in D.C. And, um, you know, one of the things that I have been very impressed with is, you know, OTA does have a very powerful lobbying team in uh, D.C. and especially you know, this year has been the, uh, working on the farm bill and it's been absolutely critical, uh, I think, to have that voice of organic. And I'm going to, so I'm going to a little bit sort of talk you through some of what uh, I discovered, especially in, in regard to um, you sure this is okay? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, especially in regard to soil building, which I realize you know we all kind of uh, get how critical soil building is to if we're gonna you know I mean I, I've been listening to the news about you know looking at pictures of the Arctic and stuff like that, and it's and even this morning it's like you know you can't come away from that without you know having you know one heart wrenching feelings, but also just kind of. You know, I think this summer has made me really start thinking about, like, wow, maybe we need to, you know, figure out how to grow food and be ready to go hide in the woods and stuff. And it's like, so desperate thoughts, you know, it's, uh, um, anyway, serious shit we're dealing with. But, uh, so, uh, but uh, one of the things that I am a, um, an advocate for is looking at what, um, you know, the tools that we have in place. And I'm a bit of a pragmatist, so, um, you know, I, I realize, you know, some of my friends are kind of like, we gotta, we gotta change all of uh, uh, cultural, the culture on the whole planet to save ourselves. And I, I absolutely believe that too, but I don't think we should let go of the tools that are in front of us that maybe can help us get out there along the way. And I, I believe, Certified organic food is one of those tools that we should not just disc along the way. Um, you know, I call it throwing the baby out with the bath, with bath water, perhaps. And so, so the Organic Trade Association is a trade association. And uh, many years ago, it spun off this group that's uh, called the uh, Organic Center, which is a nonprofit who is completely devoted to doing research into organics and how that works. And, the, the team there is like really top notch and um, you know one of the things that you realize when you start looking at um, you know organic agriculture you know I think organic agriculture that we have today was really built on the backs of a lot of farmers that were figuring it out you know and it you know I think you had to sort of be really stubborn and and just a renegade to, to pursue it because there was no structure in place for helping farmers to learn how to do organics. And, uh, you know, I think it's increasingly becoming apparent that research is absolutely needed. And this is one of the pieces that's in the Farm Bill that I think the good news with the Farm Bill is I think we've actually done fairly well at getting more money for research. You know, it's the, the it's not done deal at this point because it's still, we have a Senate version and a House version, but um, the um, there is increased funding in both versions for research uh, in their organics as well as to help to fund the National Organic Program, which is what runs USDA Organic. And I, I believe that a lot of the criticisms that have been levied at the National Organic Program have really been about lack of funding. You know, you can't expect uh, an organization that is expected to, to police what is now a, in the United States about a $50 billion industry, um, you know, on the budget that they're doing. In fact, the stories in the NLP of new people that come on their team, basically, when they're coming from other parts of government, they can't believe the job that they're doing with the small staff that they're doing and the limited funds. So, um, at any rate, the Organic Center is, a, um, I think, one of the important organizations that we have that's really doing research. And 
You know, I heard um, my, my friend Matt Dillon talking about uh, seed varieties, and you know, he's probably the guy I know, he works for Cliff Bar Foundation, and he probably knows more about the genetics of plants than anybody uh, else I know. And, you know, I've heard him say on a number of occasions that he really believed that the, the lack, the under-yielding of organic systems that exists, you know, it depends a lot on the crop. Some there isn't too much of a yield hit when you grow organic. Uh, some crops there is a lot more of a yield hit. But um, I've, I've heard him say that he really does believe that that's mostly about the genetics of the seeds we're using. So we have been breeding plants for the last 50 years to perform well under intensive chemical agriculture systems. And the plant breeding that we need to find us plants that perform well in organic systems, you know, nobody's been doing it. And underfunded, no funded. Uh, it's, it's really one of the, I believe, one of the big crimes that has occurred on the planet. So. Um, Research can go a long way. We need huge about more of it. And, uh, so, um, you know, the organic, um, I'm gonna zip along here, but a, a lot of times when people, just, you know, consumers think of what is organic, you know, it's really all about no, 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 you know, and all of that's true, you know. You know, it's hugely important that we avoid pesticides, um, uh, GMOs, uh, all of these, all of these things. So, um, and the, the organic um, program is really the only legally monitored system that is, uh, you know, giving farmers that are doing all this uh, an economic advantage in the marketplace. So, you know, I believe that, um, you know, I mean, a, a lot of people I think will will say that organic isn't enough right now, and it's not. You know, I totally get it. It's. Uh, you know, in terms of soil building, uh, we need way more than organic offers right now. But I also don't believe we should, you know, we should use organic as a jumping off point, not as a, like a place to be stuck. And the organic program does have that, some possibilities there too. So the other side of the story, and this is right out of the legislation uh, that created the organic program. So organic production practices must contain or improve the natural resources of the operation, including soil and water. Um, they must implement tillage and cultivation practices that maintain or improve the condition of the soil. Um, the, they must improve organic matter, so it specifies that in the law. Um, and organic producers must implement crop rotation. So, so in the law, in the organic law, there actually is uh, a fair amount about soil building. Uh, now, we, I don't think, have pushed that near as hard as we could, and, um, but I frequently give this example of, um, in, in the organic program, a lot of the, the National Organic Program is actually instigated by certifying organizations, like California Certified Organic Farmers is our local one. And um, in terms of organic seed use, which is specified as a, um, uh, it's not a requirement in organic because there wasn't deemed to be enough organic seed out there to require organic farmers to always use organic seed. But there is a, a clause there that says organic seeds should be used if they can economically be used. And when they did an analysis of what pushed the needle on that, what they discovered is it was the certifiers. You know, if the certifiers were out there asking the question, what are you doing? You know, are you using organic seeds? And if you aren't, why aren't you? And asking that hard question again and again every year of growers, in those regions, this organic seed use has gone way up. And uh, in the areas where it wasn't asked, it didn't. So to me, that's uh, an example of how I think even with the, in, the, in the organic program, we do have some tools that we can push soil building with. And I think that's an important um, thing to understand. In other words, it's not a done deal. Well, I, 
you know, I should, as when I introduced myself, I should have also said that I'm uh, actually a new farmer as well. I, and so I've been, I've been learning a lot about tillage and, and actually trying no-till on my place. And, and I have about two acres of vegetables. And um, I, I think that uh, the good answer to that is that tillage is not good for soils and chemicals are not good for soils. So really, the, the goal for us all, I think, should be organic no-till. That would be where we need to move. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's room in organics for, you know, improvement there. So um, tillage, one of the things I've learned as a farmer, too, is like you talk to farmers and that tillage means a different thing to everybody. So I've been asking people, well, you know, is, does tillage mean I, if I go out with a hoe and start doing, cutting my weeds and, you know, cutting into the soil, is that tillage? So tillage is a, it's a complicated conversation. And honestly, I believe that we, um, there's definitely research showing that uh, the less tillage, the better. And what I'm going to show you now is the, this little bit of the research that shows that organic is better. So where those two meet is yet to be understood completely. But, uh, so, so in my area, the, the, the land is really overgrown with what's called nutweed, which is a very viable weed, which just takes over anything that you want to plant. So what people have started doing is they just bring in all of this wood mulch and they make it like eight inches deep and then they dig a hole and they throw in the compost into it. And that's not the way I'm doing it. I'm doing it more like like layer, you know, like shoving in a blade, putting in my compost. So my method is much more labor extensive, but their method, I think, is much better for killing off the weeds so that you can actually have a better harvest. But the singing frog, like, like you guys just saw the singing frog example, they're my neighbors and, you know, lovely folks. And um, I, um, I really, what, what I'm noticing looking at farmers is that um, there's, you have to kind of look at scale to some extent. So, you know, I think we all believe that the best model is, you know, one, two acre vegetable operations, and that's where we need to go. Uh, the percentage that that represents of what is out there in terms of organic agriculture is pretty small. And um, where, where tillage, I think, has been most tricky is mid, you know, in, um, you know, I would say small, you know, I have some friends who are doing like, uh, you know, 10, 20 acres. Uh, Will Allen, who's our mutual friend, uh, is one of those people. And, you know, he's, he's learning a lot about how to do no-till in an organic system. And I think we absolutely need a huge amount of research about how to do that in the midterm and the large scale. You know, a lot of, I've, I've heard even uh, in conferences like this, you know, growers that were doing you know, huge acreage and they're doing no-till, but then when you ask them, well, are you using GMOs and glyphosate? They say, well, yeah, we are. We're trying to get rid of it. But So there, there's a huge, you know, I think it is important to understand that what works in small-scale agriculture may not work in mid-scale and it may not work in large-scale. And I think we all, you know, are of the mind that large-scale agriculture has really inherent problems and we need to try and get away from that. But I'm, I'm looking at the climate numbers and, and feeling like, you know what, we don't have time to transform agriculture into two-acre plots everywhere. We need to do every tool we can. And I, to me, the large-scale guys that are moving to organic are a huge part of the solution. I think that's kind of in a nutshell what I was going to you know, try and leave you guys with. But let me show you a few of the numbers. Uh, so um, this is a little just about the USDA organic thing. And I, uh, somebody I work with always says that they, they're really proud of the organic program in that it is probably the most... Um, the most democratic kind of a governmental body that we have right now. And if you if you ever go to the National Organic Standards Board meetings, which are all public and open to, you know, they go on and on and on debating materials. And uh, 
it is a very, you know, you could criticize the process for a lot of reasons, but you got to admit that it's pretty democratic. Everybody gets up there and gets their chance to, to uh, make a comment about it. So anyway, the organic program, um, like I would be the first one to tell you that there's all kinds of problems with it, but I think my main message is that we, we need to use it as a tool and push off from it. And I, you know, I just, I hear a lot of like, uh, people critic, you know, basically disking organic as though, oh, we're, you know, it won't, it'll never get us there in time. We're, we shouldn't even bother with it. And uh, you know, to me, it's it's just sad that people do that because I think we're missing an opportunity. Um, you know, on as part of uh, uh, being on the OTA board, I've been in D.C. and walking the hill and uh, doing some lobbying for organics and um, what. Organic does have right now is the ear of legislators, you know, and it's kind of sad that it took that, but uh, a lot of it has to do with the $50 billion sales nationally. And all of a sudden, you know, you've got conservative senators that are kind of going like, oh, you guys are actually, a, you know, a pretty big part of the farm economy. We can't just kind of write you off as a bunch of hippies like we did five years ago, right? And so, uh, and I think that that can be. Um, you know, pushed into uh, getting us more research that we need, getting us more money for organic program that we need, and pushing the organic envelope. And uh, I just don't, you know, I've never been very good with with apathy. You know, I, apathy drives me crazy. I always want to do something. I want to, and uh, you know, so to me, you know, some of my friends that kind of like write off organic as though it's never going to get us there, and then. Then you turn around and they're they're eating it, you know, non-organic food in the world, and it's kind of like I'm kind of going like, really? It's like, uh, you know, we should all be, you know, making all our relatives and friends eat organic. That should be the the bottom line, and then we can push the soil envelope further. And that is the way that I'd like to see us move. But yes. Right. I'm from Italy. Yeah. yeah. So, what, what you right. So she's saying organic food is expensive, which I think is a huge. You know, I and I understand that, but I I I don't think the solution to that is a race to the bottom. In fact, uh, you know, we don't want to compromise farming systems because we want to make cheap food, and that's been. Honestly, that's been one of the big problems in the country. So I think that we should be, in fact, I've been putting thought lately into how do we, how do we create an organic farming system that actually pays farmers enough to stay in the game? Because what I see happening, you know, in grain has been a little bit of a unique thing because the, uh, the market for grain has been in organic grain in this country has way outstripped the production of capability. I think that's a temporary blip. Uh, if you look at the produce industry right now with organics, um, the, there are all these big farmers getting involved in organics. I mean, like 30,000 acres of vegetables. And uh, that's, I think, the same thing is going on in the dairy industry. And I think the biggest danger we have is that all of a sudden it's going to create this competitive environment where everybody, you know, all the people that are really doing agriculture right can't compete anymore. So I totally get it. I think the answer to, to uh, food prices is that people should be earning more money so that they can afford to. And, and yeah, and obviously the government, I mean, you know, I always, you know, I can't talk at all about the economics of any situation in the United States without just reminding us all, you know, half of the, t half of our tax, tax dollars to the U.S. government goes to the build military. And, you know, that's absolutely unsustainable. You know, we, if we took just a little bit of that money back, we could have the best schools and all the organic food and, you know, and that's where we need to go. So. 
the Chinese government, the Chinese military, and the Russian military. Why, why can't our government make a commitment to the health of our people? I mean, it's more than. And we haven't even done that with schools. And no. when, yet you look at the research, and it's so obvious that. You know, what we're doing to our kids with pesticide poisoning is just, it's a, it's a crime. And I mean, that has to really be figured in terms of the cost. When you look at the cost of food, you have to look at the cost to your health of yeah. buying yeah. food. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. because these costs get externalized yeah. in capitalism, that it looks like conventional food is cheaper. But it's yeah. not. And you know, subsidized. The conventional yeah, food system is definitely Right, but right. subsidized. Right. 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 subsidized. Right. So it's, it's not. Right. Yeah. Did you have a comment, sir? I wanted to address the, the idea that organic food is expensive. That's a mindset that we need to, to look at and, and to, to get people to understand what is expense. You know, what, when you buy food that you know, has all these chemicals and is grown away from the bad for the earth, you know, where, where is the expense? You know, and I think probably one of the, the things that a lot of people are unaware of, but I think the, the real problem that's keeping us from moving to a more organic um, agriculture system in this country is not the availability of land, it's people. You know, we just don't have people learning organic agriculture. And, and, we, and we've also made it so difficult to, I mean, I have organic farmers that are on small acreage that said, you know, I have one friend that told me that he figured he did 10 years analysis of his budget and he figured out that he had been losing money up to the town of, and uh, he's on an uh, acre and a half, and he said he'd been losing $2,000 per year, every year. Uh, so you can't expect, you know, you can't expect a system to function viably with that kind of a model. But, so let me show you a little bit, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, there'll be time for questions afterward too, but uh, sorry, you can't see this too well. Uh, that's my compost operation on uh, my farm. And uh, so organic has always been, you know, feeding the soil has been one of the major tenets of that. And I always tell people that organic agriculture does not really function without soil building. And uh, so much of, you know, I'm going to show you some numbers about uh, what carbon is sequestered in organics, but most of that has been a little bit sort of um, by chance, you know, in, in a way organic farmers were adding carbon to their soils because they wanted to have fertile land that was growing good crops, right? You know, it's only been in the last five years that we even understood that carbon sequestration in agricultural land was such an important tool about turning around climate change. But so what, what organic has achieved thus far was really just for soil building. And, uh, you know, when you have healthy soils, I tell people it's, it's a lot like the human body, you know. It's like if you, if you eat junk food, you end up, um, you know, with a compromised immune system. And you, then if you pay no attention to that, you end up really sick. What do you do? You end up at the pharmacy with trying to fish yourself out with drugs. And it's the same with agriculture. It's all about, you know, healthy soil produces plants that are resistant to insects and disease. And that is, so it's an absolutely different model. And uh, so organic has been criticized about not pushing that soil building fast enough. And I think that that's, you know, true. But uh, nonetheless, it, it is part of organics is all I wanted to. And obviously some of that has to do with um, the microbiome in the soils, which we've discovered is hugely important. You know, so it's not just about putting carbon in soils through compost and cover crops, but then when you do that, this whole chain reaction occurs. So the, the bacteria start to digest the cover crops and they sequester carbon and, and it's a cascading effect and uh, quite powerful. So, um, you know, obviously the uh, pesticides are killing all that microbiome in soils. So to me, that's why, you know, no-till systems that use pesticides are, you know, they're probably fighting against themselves uh, is what's happening. And uh, so what we really need is both. Um, 
So this is where um, this study that was done by the Organic Center in, uh, um, together with Northeast University. So it was a really a, a you know very top-notch study done by a university uh, and uh, came up with some pretty dramatic numbers. And this was so what they ba basically did is they compared organic farms uh, against conventional farms, matching size and and uh, um, kind and uh, the outcome you know they basically just did soil analysis on all those operations and the outcome was 13 percent higher soil organic matter in the organic system um, and 154 some of these other compounds humic acid and uh, fulvic acid um, are more there are also forms of carbon that are more uh, sort of deeper more stable forms of carbon and um, so you know, pretty dramatic numbers, considering that organic wasn't even trying to sequester carbon, and it's just an outcome. I, the way I am, uh, because I'm kind of a, just practical, I looked at those numbers, and they didn't mean a whole lot to me. So I, I kind of took it, I tried to break it down a little bit, and uh, take a look at, like, what does that actually mean? So if you look at the, the uh, math on the top is how many acres of cropland there is in the U.S. and the 11,000 pounds of carbon is actually the um, the amount of carbon sequestered in organic soils over and above the conventional soils. So that's an addition of of carbon that exists from organics. And so if you if you extrapolate that out. Um, you know, it would be that 4.3 trillion pounds of additional carbon sequestered just from a change from a conventional system to an organic system. So, you know, just for comparison, that's about a 16, I'm sorry, sixth amount of the carbon released per year. Um, and obviously, if you extrapolated that to the, the whole world, it turns into that 38 trillion pounds of carbon per year that we could convert with organic systems and, uh, you know, also I think important to understand in that equation too is that um, that's organic as practice today without us really pushing that organic envelope like I, I believe we still can. Um, and then the other, the other interesting thing about it is there's a lot of research that shows that carbon is actually sequestered at, you know, meters deep. And, uh, you know, the way that occurs is that, um, you know, you basically, if you put compost on soils, there are plants that are pulling that carbon down, building roof systems is the way it works. So they'll go down, you know, uh, meters and the roots decompose and that's carbon that's actually stored deep in the soil. And uh, this, all these numbers that I'm showing you are basically soil tests in the first six inches of soil. So the, this may actually, these numbers may actually be the tip of the iceberg. And we need, you know, again, we need way more science on this because uh, we don't really understand the potential that could exist. But to me, it's actually pretty exciting that, you know, we've done that and we, we didn't really know we were doing it. Uh, so focused on the organic farmer, maybe we should be more focused on the people that have any soil around them whatsoever, creating a sink for carbon. Because this whole idea that the farmers are gonna do it, no, each person has to do it. We have to find the soil and we have to recover it. And if we're waiting for somebody magical out there, like Singing Frog Farms to do it, or for you to do it, you know, I'm gonna wait too long, I'm gonna be dead and burned up. So she's, you got that, she's basically saying how important it is to, for us all to do soil building everywhere, and I totally get it. It's, uh, my sweetheart says that uh, building compost is a very radical thing, and I think we all got to embrace that, and uh, anybody that's not composting should definitely learn. Yeah. So when I, I, I took this a little bit further and uh, you know, just kind of went into the numbers to understand them better myself and to... Uh, because I, you know, when I hear, hear percentages, it doesn't, it doesn't speak to me a lot. But so, one of the interesting things I did is I, I had to kind of to get a handle on what those carbon numbers meant. 
I had to kind of take a look at, well, what is the average American diet? Like how much food, how much land does it take to support us? And uh, to me, that sort of revealed this re other really interesting stat, which is the difference between a vegan diet and a regular American animal food diet. And it, it looked like it was about two acres. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. So it's, it's animal production the way we're eating it in America right now. Factory farm, yeah. So that was about two acres per person, but a vegan person was about half, a, half an acre. So that's a one to four. So obviously that brings to light like how valuable a vegan diet is in, in uh, sequestering carbon and changing things. Tom, did you have a? Yeah, when you said row crops, right? Just industrial crops, what you Yeah, I, I term that as being all basically agricultural crops that are grown in rows. So I, when I say that, I mean corn, soy, but I also mean vegetables. It's basically all... Uh, yeah, I get, yeah, orchards are in there. But notably, what's not in there is grazing land, which... Uh, yeah, so, and, you know, there is, you know, I, I don't have any numbers about that, but, you know, if you haven't heard John Wick from the Marine Carbon Project speak about... Uh, you know, grazing land, carbon sequestration is like, is awesome and uh, has numbers that are, you know, even better than this, I think, because there's more acres of grazing land and, uh, um, you know, it's maybe food. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so basically when I made that assumption, I kind of averaged it out just to say, well, if it's two to a half, you know, let's just... I just picked an acre per person because it was a nice round number. And I said, well, if it is an acre person, then how much carbon would be sequestered by that person changing from a conventional diet to an organic diet? And I ended up with that 11,000 uh, pounds of carbon number. Um, and that represents about four cars taken off the road in a year, which I, you know, it's, it's not going to save us, but it's a piece of it, is I think all, I think the only thing I want to sort of contribute here. And we shouldn't just write it off as it's like, oh, it, it's inconsequential. And uh, so um, that's, that's pretty much I was gonna, all I was going to say. I, I feel like I uh, just want to impress upon uh, everybody that we shouldn't give up on organics. It's, you know, yeah, it's got a problem, but we need to work and embrace it and push for it. And, uh, um, you know, I think it, it, it is a very important tool to healing things. Uh, yeah, Mark, one thing I'm thinking about this pesticide issue. Oh, yeah, about the pesticides. When we say no pesticides in organic, there has to be, we mean no synthetic pesticides, Correct. because biopesticides are fine. Um, you know, I'm working with Howard on this thing that, that we're putting together. You know, where would that fall on this? So I think we have to be, I mean, certainly the, the little, even at St. Front, when they show the pictures of the little things, the, the biopesticides, the little insects that eat the, Things we, you know, right. so we have to be careful about using that word because it can be pesticides don't have to be horrible, they're just horrible if they're synthetic. Right, you're absolutely correct about that. Um, so, no, but it is, you know, what I tell people is, you know, when you look at the pesticides that are allowed in organic systems and you compare them against the uh, I, I didn't even realize that the this chemical that you know was. Is, was in the process of being banned. Some of you can kind of fill me in better than I know, but uh, chlorophyll, chlor 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 yeah. You know, you know, nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. I mean, and I didn't even realize until I was reading the news media lately that that's what was in Raid, 
you know, that I think a lot of us grew up, you know, I remember people spraying raid in my, where I grew you know, when I was 10 or something, it was like, that's what it was, it was like this, you know, um, chemical that's like screwing up with our nervous systems, you know, so dramatically, and so anyway, the, the pesticides that are used in organics, like, you know, sulfur is an example, I mean, they're, they're like night and day different in terms of their toxicity. And I think it, that's why, but you're absolutely right. You know, the terminology is, is not as good as it could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Um, we can't test for organic, right? We can test for non-GMO. Well, you, you can test for GMOs, but you can, you, test. can you test whether or not something is organic? Well, you, you can and you can't. Uh, you can or, test or, you, you can use testing of pesticides as a tool to, to enforce organic systems, but you can, there's not like a test that's all conclusive that this is organic. And part of that has to do with the fact that there are absolutely so many chemical pesticides out there used that you know, most of the testing that's happened has been looking for certain ones, and uh, it's, it's hard to... You know, I mean, I've, I've been asking, you know, like asking, well, when people say, well, we've tested for pesticides, I always kind of say, okay, which ones did you test for and which ones didn't you? And you usually find that they have tested for some of the major ones, but there are whole classes of them. In fact, glyphosate is, the, is one of them that has traditionally not been tested for. Them. Uh, it takes about a million dollars to equip a lab to test for glyphosate. It's very expensive. So yeah. mostly it's not tested yeah. for. But, you know, I think part of a little bit good news there is that at least in the California Organic Program, you know, California is way ahead of the rest of the country on a lot of these issues. Uh, not to say that it's, you know, doing as well as it could, but... Uh, but in uh, the California Organic Program, I think that they are starting to do more meaningful testing uh, as a, you know, a check and balance. You know, it can't prove that something's organic, but at least it will, you know, help us identify problems. And uh, I've always been, even with GMO testing, which I was on the non-GMO project board for a number of years. And, um, the testing for GMOs is really good, but you also have to understand what material you're testing for. And uh, we're going to have a talk, I'm, I'm going to be on the stage tomorrow with uh, uh, some of my real heroes talking about GMOs specifically. And uh, one of the things that uh, is happening is that all these new GMOs are coming along. And the real danger with them is that there's not tests for any of them. And uh, did you did you know that Coca-Cola just uh, they they have this sweetener that is uh, basically a, a genetically engineered bacteria that is designed to spit out this stevia-like compound, and uh, um, it's a uh, uh, Forever Sweet is the name of it. Um, Ever Ever Sweet is what they're calling it. And uh, so we're we're gonna. You know, I think within the year, be seeing Coca-Cola on the market with non-calorie stevioids that are spit out by GMO bacteria that have absolutely had no testing. You know, they don't even have a test for it. So, and whether they've done any studies to guarantee, you know, figure out if it's safe or not, we're we're entering this brave new world of untestable GMOs. I'm afraid. So. Uh, it's uh, sorry. Well, the scientists disagree. I mean, they're working on that. Our lab in Iowa tells yeah. us they're going to build a test for the CRISPR technology uh, soon. Yeah, or John, John Fabian is. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm really concerned about uh, the turning on and off the uh, RNA in a plant, and and how these these GMOs could could potentially turn on and off our own. Um, DNA or RNA to like activate our disease processes. Like let's say I carry an Alzheimer gene that would activate when I'm 90. Maybe it's going to activate when I'm 40 if I get the right GMO. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and part of what's happening, you know, like I, I was kind of shocked. If you haven't read the story of the Impossible Burger, it's, it's you know you can buy them all over you know California now and. 
and I think part of what the and Stacy Malkin is going to be on the stage tomorrow, and she has like she's a she's amazing. She has a huge amount of information about it. But uh, if you haven't read the story, it's worth reading simply simply from the point of view of uh, how did this happen? I mean, it's like when you read how it came to market, you kind of come away from it. This can't be legal because they have done absolutely no health testing on it, and yet they're producing this brand new protein into the market that's being eaten all over the place, and um, we, don't, we don't know. Yeah, where, where are the guinea pigs? Exactly. But the, 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 the crime about it is, I mean, it's like, we may, it may be 20 years before we really realize what the health impacts were, right? Proteins are, uh, you know, you know, these GMOs are all producing brand new proteins that have never been in the human diet before. And proteins are intimately connected with allergy, allergies. So, you know, a lot, you know, I, I tell you, I, I'm a, you know, grocer. I used, you know, so I've been a grocer for actually almost 50 years now, believe it or not. It's, uh, <laughs> we're going to celebrate our 50th year this year. But, uh, they are doing a good job because they are reducing that's what they say. You know, I think that we need to do some really well, the, the analysis about, on it. One but, really sad thing about the Impossible Burger is how the vegan community yeah. is behind it, right? Yeah. And yeah. so they d divided and conquered. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, I was a vegetarian for 30 years, but when I started to understand that 100% grass-fed, grass-finished beef is good for the environment, yeah. that's when I decided occasionally, yes, I will eat that. But it pissed off all all my vegan friends who are eating Impossible Burgers and stuff. And they're eating genetically engineered burgers financed by Silicon Valley yeah, yeah. and Bill Gates. These are people who love genetic engineering. This is a wedge to divide us. You but know, the Impossible, I, I learned that the Impossible Burger uh, company had uh, basically gotten $400 million in money. You know, so to produce a veggie burger, they need <laughs> So where is all that money going? You know, and I think that what you're seeing happen is that most of it is going into promotion. So they are doing, and I think they're really purposely trying to drive that wedge into our community and uh, try and convince us, well, this is a cure for... No organic ingredients. No, right, they are right, spending, right. Uh, I work in but, the food industry, they're spending $50 per pound in producing the, the, the burger, and they're selling it for $12. So they're losing money in doing this. Wow. It's an experiment. Go Bill Gates. Yeah. Bill Gates. <laughs> it's, it's no. So I got a couple yeah. comments. So Impossible was started with $175 million. Uh, primarily from Colsa Ventures, one of the guys in uh, Sun Microsystems. And uh, so that is a pretty good start. Um, <laughs> the second thing is there's a seed company that's using CRISPR technology to create seeds for a particular uh, ecosystem. So it's to the soil, and it's using CRISPR, which one debates whether that's you know, good or bad. They just received $65 million of funding. Um, Frank, but the thing about Monsanto is this $290 million lawsuit against them for that uh, caretaker, the greenskeeper at the school, has said, uh, chill over Bayer's stock. Yep. And they just recently acquired it. And maybe you don't remember, but the RBST was originally a Monsanto product. And they spit that out because of the issues coming up with people not wanting to have milk, sold it to Roche Pharmaceuticals. So they may, Bayer may get rid of the glyphosate side of the business and say, we're not going to do it anymore, but that doesn't mean someone else will step into that right. evil empire. Third thing I want to say is uh, the Purdue chicken is now has just launched last week an organic chicken. 
called Purdue Simple or something like that. And it's about 40% less cost, which is how they're pitching. It's a factory farm or organic. Well, what's interesting is that <laughs> Purdue is now the Department of Agriculture Secretary. So one wonders why that funding increased because there you go. So when you talk about scale, from two acre farms to 30,000 acre farms. Would that work? Would no till work for about farms? No. It's just too big. You know, I, I think I disagree with that. You know, the, the, the animal thing is a problem. You know, you get that many animals together, and it's, you know, it's really, really, you know, maybe impossible to do sustainably. But, but organic farming, you know, it's not. It'll never be the quality that you'll get from seeing frog fire. You know? no. <laughs> but, but that doesn't mean, and I think this is, again, I believe that we need to move ahead. And what organic has is a huge following. Yes. And we can push that. But, it, you know, I believe that, you know, all Americans should eat organic food. That should be our goal. And then we move past that to, you know, figure out how to do it even more sustainably. Um, right. But and at the consumer level, because at the end of the day, the customer owns the company and they have all the money. Because it, I'll give you an example. So there's 225 million passenger vehicles in, in the United States. That excludes trucks, buses, all this other stuff. If the Fortune 500 owned all those cars, they each would have to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 million cars each. To buy, to keep the car market viable, which is anywhere from 13 to 15 million per year, they have to buy almost 800,000 cars each. That's the Fortune 500. So if you look at the scale, if we actually are the scale, we make these consumer choices. For example, Frito Lay came out with organic Tostitos and organic Doritos and all that stuff, but people eat bomb. So at the end of the day, the customer is really driving. Right. Yeah, I shop at your store all the time, happily. Pay a handsome price every time I leave the place, and I never have one regret. Because I know it's going towards. I think this is really solution. important. We get asked this question all the time is organic worth that anymore? Right? Well, we're the Organic Consumers Association, right? We have a big network, two million people in the U.S. in our network. You have to have a very simple answer. You say, uh, yes, organic is better than chemical agriculture and better than factory farms. But we need to move to the next stage of organic, which is, which is regenerative and organic. And that's where we're going. We already have certification for things like biodynamic that are higher than USDA organic. Well, you're going to start seeing eventually second seals. You'll see the USDA organic, but you'll see something else. You know? But there's, there's a couple of other things really important. The organic industry has completely ignored ranchers from the beginning. We got half a million ranchers in the U.S., most of whom voted for Trump. All right? All right. 100% grass-fed, grass-finished beef is better than USDA organic. It's higher standards. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna ask a restaurant, is your beef? 100% grass-fed, grass-finished. Well, I want to ask, is it American Grass-Fed Association certified? Is it U.S. certified? Is it local? Whatever. It's like the organic movement has to embrace the grass-fed movement. The other movement we've got to embrace, young people in the urban agriculture movement, you know, they don't feel like they're part of our community part of the organic community. They're a lot of the ones who say, organic's not worth it. You know, but how are they gardening and farming in the urban areas? Organically. And you know, permaculture and all that. So, very important. We gotta have a 10 second answer to, what is regenerative agriculture? It's the next stage of organic and ranching, you know, and land conservation. That's it. That starts the conversation. But don't say anything, you know, don't get sidetracked so much. But see, part of, part of what I believe is that I agree 100% with everything Ronnie's saying, um, but we can't wait. You know, I'm, I've watched the organic seal sort of slowly get momentum in the marketplace, and, and I, I think that if we got a regenerative organic seal that was 
out in the marketplace and recognized by a significant part of consumers in the next five years, we'd be lucky. And it might take 10. So, right. But what I'm saying is there isn't time. You know, it's like if you look at the Arctic melting, we got to sequester carbon fast. Yeah, well, the, therefore, we got to take advantage that, of every tool we have available. That's it's all. not pesticides. It's factory farms that are the number one killer of the environment and the climate. Eighty you percent know, of American farmland is either, you know, to feed to feed the cows in the feedlots or, you know, before they get there. It's just like we need to unite with vegans and agree we are all we are never gonna eat one more bite or take one more sip of factory farm foods. If we do that, we that'll be a big step forward. But before that we got to stop attacking one another, vegans and organic proponents and ranchers and that, and start communicating.